Hello. So uh, today I'm going to talk about avoidance behavior, uh, which is a form of instrumental conditioning in which you make a response in order to prevent an aversive stimulus from happening. So you're avoiding the aversive stimulus. And there are several different forms of avoidance conditioning procedures. Uh, we're going to begin with the discriminated avoidance procedure because that was the first one that was uh, examined. And uh, it also illustrates that the uh, study of avoidance learning uh, emerged from the study of Pavlovian conditioning. In fact, uh, the first uh, avoidance experiment was conducted by a Russian psychologist or physiologist, Bekhterev, who thought he was doing Pavlovian conditioning, but in fact, it was an avoidance conditioning procedure uh, with human subjects. Uh, okay, the uh, study of avoidance, uh, it's, uh, there, it's, there's not, not many uh, practical implications or applications or, well, actually there are, if you think about it, I take that back. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a fairly theoretical, it's a highly theoretical. Uh, uh, line of inquiry, but it's a very interesting line of inquiry because, you know, if you make a response that prevents an aversive stimulus, and that's the consequence, so that's what makes it an instrumental procedure, most people will jump to the conclusion that the reason the behavior occurs is to prevent the aversive stimulus. That is, you're responding in order to be able to avoid the aversive event. Turns out that simple idea is not a part of any major theory of avoidance learning, <laughs> which is really pretty remarkable. So avoidance learning departs from our presumptions about why we make avoidance responses. <clears throat> okay. Well, if we may uh, look at the, uh, the first slide here. Uh, the first slide also um, just highlights a, a major theoretical problem. And this the theoretical problem was uh, uh, identified by O. Hobart Mauer. <laughs> That's kind of an old fashioned name, Orville Hobart Mauer. <laughs> O.H. Maurer was a major theorist in the middle of the 20th century who, who really uh, laid out the, uh, uh, the basic ideas that we use to this day in thinking about avoidance learning. And uh, he, he tried to solve this fundamental avoidance problem, which is that a successful avoidance response uh, prevents the aversive stimulus. Therefore, a successful avoidance response is followed by nothing. <laughs> and if a response is followed by nothing, <laughs> how, what's to reinforce the response? And so all major theories of avoidance have <clears throat> created or identified things that occur as a consequence of making the avoidance response that can serve to uh, reinforce the avoidance behavior. Okay, and the next slide uh, shows you basically the Bechterev procedure, uh, which is also a procedure that Maurer studied pretty extensively, signal or discriminated avoidance procedure. So what makes it signal avoidance uh, is that the aversive stimuli are signaled by a warning stimulus, a CS, a tone. So think about this as a tone followed by shock. And on the uh, right, high, uh, right side of the figure, we've got what happens if the subject doesn't make the avoidance response. If the subject does not make the avoidance response, the tone is followed by the shock. There's no response on the third line. In contrast, what happens if the subject does make the avoidance response? Well, here the tone comes on, <clears throat> the subject makes the response, and look carefully as to what happens when the response occurs. Of course, the U.S. is not delivered, but 
uh, what's really critical here is that typically the warning stimulus is turned off. So the response turns off the warning stimulus. Now, in a typical avoidance procedure, um, this could be done in a shuttle box. The uh, uh, response is running from one side to the other periodically as tone comes on and right has to run to the other side before the shock is delivered. If he makes it across, <clears throat> the tone goes off and he's good for the inner trial interval. If he doesn't make it across, the shock occurs and then he has to run, run over. Uh, so these trials with and without avoidance responses are intermixed. They, um, they occur, uh, you know, depending on whether the subject responds or not. Okay, that's the procedure. What explains the acquisition of the avoidance behavior? The O.H. Uh, Maurer came up with what's known as two-factor theory, and we've had uh, theoretical advances since then, but we have never abandoned two-factor theory. We've supplemented it with a third factor of other, other mechanisms, but we're still are holding on to two-factor theory. And the next slide shows you the critical elements of two-factor theory. Uh, two-factor theory tells you that there are different kinds of things learned on trials when the response is made versus trials when the response is not made. If there is no response, that's basically a classical conditioning trial in which uh, the warning stimulus is followed by the US. So that uh, kind of pairing of the warning stimulus with uh, shock results in the conditioning of fear to the warning stimulus or CS. Uh, so uh, no response trials are basically fear conditioning trials and the fear gets uh, conditioned to the warning stimulus. How about on trials when the subject does make a response? Well, here, as I emphasized in the preceding slide, the response terminates the warning stimulus. And if it terminates the warning stimulus, it <clears throat> turns off the fear that was elicited by that warning stimulus. And so the response is reinforced by fear reduction. So it's not the absence of shock that reinforces the behavior, but it's the reduction of fear that reinforces the behavior. And uh, fear reduction as a source of reinforcement, uh, as a way to control fear, is uh, actually uh, uh, being reconsidered as a major strategy uh, to help people cope with fear in uh, anxiety uh, and fear disorders. Okay, so that's basically a two-factor theory. And uh, as I mentioned, two-factor theory remains very much with us today and many aspects of two-factor theory have been verified by lots and lots of experiments. There have been lots of experiments with usually with the shuttle box kind of situation, the warning stimulus and response being running over to the other side in order to turn off the warning stimulus and also prevent the shock from occurring. But the prevention of the U.S. turns out to be kind of a secondary and not the critical factor in the, in the acquisition of the avoidance response. So <clears throat> given that uh, there have been so many of these uh, shuttle box disc discriminated avoidance experiments, uh, what, what are the implications of two-factor theory and how have these experiments fared in testing these implications? The next slide shows you that. So <clears throat> one implication of two-factor theory, of course, is that fear reduction can serve as a reinforcer. And uh, there have been a lot of experiments to evaluate that prediction. So you can, you can condition fear using straight Pavlovian procedures. You don't have to do it in a discriminated avoidance procedure. But then you can create an instrumental situation where the subject responds to turn off on uh, the conditioned fear stimulus, and they will acquire instrumental responses under those circumstances. There are lots of experiments on that. Another important Im implication, which turns out to be really important for uh, cognitive behavior therapy, is that extinction of the warning stimulus or CS uh, 
should extinguish the avoidance response. That is, if you extinguish uh, the fear that was conditioned to the warning stimulus, the avoidance behavior should drop off. And there have been a lot of experiments on that. There have been a lot of experiments on just how you conduct the extinction. Of course, uh, it's extinction. And so it uh, you have to uh, worry about recovery effects and uh, those kinds of complications. Uh, but generally, the more often a uh, warning stimulus is presented, the uh, less fear there will be of the warning stimulus and then the avoidance behavior uh, will be uh, will drop out. The uh, next prediction is that conditioned fear and conditioned responding should go hand in hand. That is, uh, you should begin to see conditioned avoidance responses only after a conditioned fear has developed to the warning stimulus. And that's true for uh, uh, early in acquisition. But as you continue doing avoidance training, there a decoupling occurs between avoidance behavior and levels of fear. And so this third uh, implication is true, but only early in training. And you get this interesting decoupling between conditioned fear and the avoidance response. Uh, you might think that that's pretty strange and you didn't, you haven't experienced that in your own avoidance responses. Well, if you make that claim, you would be wrong. It turns out <clears throat> driving a car, steering correctly, an automobile, particularly at high speeds, is mostly an avoidance problem. <laughs> and it's a discriminated avoidance problem. That is, if you let go of the steering wheel, what is going to happen? Well, the car is going to drift to one side or another, depending on the tilt of the road and the tire pressure and other, other kind of factors. So <clears throat> what does steering correctly require? Well, it requires for you to, to detect this drift away from your, well, uh, away from your target path and then making a correction to avoid the car ending up in the ditch, <laughs> okay? So driving a car is very much a discriminated avoidance uh, task in which the warning stimulus is the car drifting uh, off the road. You make corrections to avoid ending up in the ditch. Now think about the level of fear that's associated with that kind of avoidance behavior. Well, if you talk to uh, uh, teenagers who are first just learning to drive, driving a car is a pretty stressful experience for them. They're experiencing a lot of fear. And particularly as the car starts to drift, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> and they overcorrect and there's all kinds of stuff. But this little high level of fear. Now take, uh, in contrast, uh, someone who's been driving for 10 years and sets off for a trip uh, to visit uh, grandparents uh, five hours away and starts to drive. Are they in a state of fear the whole time? <laughs> no. In fact, uh, you have to worry about them falling asleep <laughs> rather than being in a state of fear. But they're still doing this discriminated avoidance responding. So for a highly trained avoidance response, there's a decoupling. <clears throat> and if there is a decoupling, what maintains the avoidance behavior? Well, that's a really good question. And that requires uh, postulating a third factor in addition to the two-factor theory that we've talked about so far. And I'm going to tell you about that third factor in the next episode. So stay tuned. See you next time.